So today we're down here with Joel Salatin, the owner of Polyface Farm. For those of you in the homesteading and farming community who have been living under, under a rock for the last decade, Joel is probably the nation's most famous farmer. He's an entrepreneur, a statesman. He's an inspiration and a mentor to thousands of people across the world. He's also a bit of a thespian who does a one-man play uh, he likes to call him a tour, but I call him a one-man play, and I've watched him expand over the years, and it's always changing, and it's very informative and entertaining and inspirational. I know you did a, a bit of thespian yes. in um, high school. I did, right? I did, yes. So you've kind of carried that I, I, over. I, mean, I had a letter jacket. with. I was a true thespian. Yeah, I had a thespian letter. Yeah. A, a letter. I did drama, drama and debate and forensics in yeah. high school and, and college. So it's really paid off then in this, because... It has. I, I'm always amazed by how when you're doing your tours, you keep it fresh and new and enthusiastic, even on the days you're probably not feeling too well, and you don't really want to be out there. So uh, my wife and I came down about a month ago, and, you know, they always say, don't meet your heroes because they'll let you down. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard that expression. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So after the tour, you were hanging out, and people were coming up to you and getting their picture taken and saying hello. And I was a bit hesitant of that. I'm like, oh, what if this guy's a jerk, right? <laughs> so I, my wife went over, and so I figured I'd go over too. And um, he kind of busted my chops a little bit with a mix of self-deprecating humor, saying we both married up. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely agree with that. Probably more so me. I married up a lot more, definitely. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a way of men bonding is busting each other's chops. Sure, sure. So, uh, so I really appreciated that, and I felt, oh, this is a good guy. I like him. So another way uh, men bond is over a cold drink, and I don't really, uh, I don't partake in alcohol on, it's a, on very rare, rare occasion. Oh, what have you, you got chocolate milk? So this is, yeah, and I have no affiliation with this farm. <laughs> this is called Manning Hill Farm. Uh-huh. They were up in, uh, Winchester, New Hampshire. Okay. They make milk from uh, Dutch belted cows. Okay. And this is, I know you like chocolate milk based, yeah. solely based on you bragging yeah. about the chocolate milk in yeah, your farm yeah. store. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I know man. you. We're going to get some uh, some free state. This is some. Free state chocolate yeah, milk. Yeah, this is amazing milk. Now I know you hate sterility, so I took your glass and I dunked it in the pond out back good, for good. you. Good, good. All know, right, all right. Keep that immune system going. <laughs> So I figure we'll have a little meal bonding here over a cold drink. Oh, man. How about that? Look at that. This is amazing milk, I tell That's you. That's great. Wow. Cheers, Hey, Joel. cheers indeed. Mmm. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. that's good. Is that some amazing that's milk? That's really milk? good. It really mm. is. Mm. I love this stuff. I'm glad I don't live too close to this because I'd mm. be 500 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's so, good. I'm glad you like it. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of wives and marrying up, this lifestyle of farming and homesteading, whether you have an acre and a half or hundreds of acres right. like you do, it really takes a special type of spouse to make it all work. Even if they're not into what you're doing, they have to be supportive of what you're doing. So Donna, who you've met... Um, yeah. She was brought up in California. She's a graduate of Berkeley. Mm. So, you yeah. know, she, she, mm -hmm. uh, she didn't stand a, she didn't, what's the saying? Uh, she didn't have a fighting chance, right? Mm -hmm. So we're completely different on so many things, but one thing we're completely overlayered on is our love of nature, love of um, giving life back to soil, and worms and chickens and all that. So that crossover for us has really maintained our relationship of being supportive of each other, what we're doing, even though we come from different angles. So how important is it, do you feel, and what should a person look for when choosing a spouse if they're going to get into homesteading and farming? Yeah, great, great point. And in my, one of my early books, You Can Farm, which has been my kind of bestseller, <clears throat> I have a chapter in there that talks about this very issue and and what I say in there is 
the single biggest reason ventures fail, and venture is pretty broad, but, but is um, disagreement between spouses about where they're headed, where they, what, what they want to do. And, um, and it's, so it's a, it, it, is a, it is a really big deal. Now, um, I was blessed in, can you, can you get along when you have, you know, two really different, yeah, you can, but it's a real handicap. Um, and so I married a farm girl. Um, Teresa's a true farm girl. When we got married, you know, she drove the tractor, uh, helped put bales of hay on a hay elevator. Um, so she wasn't afraid of hard work. No, dirt. indeed. No, indeed. And she, she was actually a home ec major in college. So she, we were high school sweethearts. And when I was 16, she was 15. She made me a suit. I mean, from scratch. A suit. A suit. Yeah. Yeah. So she's a, I mean, she can sew, she can fix anything. Came from a family of, of a farm family and they canned, you know, hundreds of quarts of stuff. And so, you know, she cans. The, the point is that, um, that the, the closer you can be in, in, in experience and that kind of compatibility, that gives you a leg up. Now, that doesn't mean that your personalities are the same. So I found that to be true with Donna and I completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, so it, it was, when you start talking about personalities, you know, you're thinking about like normally one's a spender, one's a saver. You know, relatively more spender. One one holds on to money a little tighter than the other one. Um, uh, generally, uh, one's a, a more a starter of projects, and one's a more finisher of projects. Uh, one's usually a little more messy, and one's a little more cleany. One's yes. asleep at eight o'clock. One's asleep at midnight. One's a morning. One's <laughs> yeah. an evening. Exactly. Yeah. And then a big one is one of the biggest ones. Teresa and I've uh, dealt with is uh, extrovert introvert. And of course, you know, I'm the extrovert. She's the introvert. And and here we have you know, we have fifteen thousand visitors a year here on the farm. So this is something that we've had to you know we've had to to work with. Um, and, but 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 those personality things, to me. Are not as big as that overall mission compatibility, yeah. and, and, and even experiential compatibility. Uh, you know where, um, you know if you if you both gardened as children, if you both cooked from scratch, if you both um, you know grew up in homes where where entertainment was outside, get out the door. You know as opposed to. One entertainment is all screen time, and the other one is entertainment is all in nature. For example, yeah. those are th those are those are incongruous, and I think I think the closer that you can find uh, to to getting those shared experiences and backgrounds, uh, the better chance you have of of um, you know working through your your personality. And what would you say the biggest red flag to avoid would be in seeking a spouse to to cohabitate on a farm? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the the biggest the biggest red flag. I mean, eh, there's a couple pretty big red flags. I mean, one one is, you know, uh, they say when you you know when you have a farm, you marry a second wife. I mean, this is mainly for men, um, and I think it's I think in other words. If the cows are out, supper gets cold till the cows come in. Get in, okay? So you definitely need a spouse that's willing to share. Yeah, your... yeah. So, so, the, so the shared schedule. You, you, you need somebody that's not regimented, because a farm is a, a farm is flexible. You know, it's um, it's it's a it's a very flexible thing. Well, one, and, no matter what, at least once a day, Murphy's Law is going to kick your butt. Oh body. yeah, yeah. It, it never fails, no matter how well you plan out things. And it's great to have a spouse that's that's right. A, easily adjustable to right. different situations. Right. So so adjusting like that is really big. And, and the other thing is just is just to be willing to help, to enjoy helping. Um, and whatever it is. Uh, can you can you hold this up here while I get the you know bolt in? I mean those kinds of things. You you know if if um, if one doesn't want to get dirty and one doesn't mind it, 
a lot of things take more than two hands. You yeah. know, Definitely. hold this, you know, uh, uh, work together. So, um, so that's that's a big one, and another one, another one is definitely the children. H- how are we going to handle the children? Are they going to be in ballet, little league, and, and and every you know activity you can imagine, or are they going to? Are, are we going to um, to limit that? And then, and then figure out how to create a habitat here, where they will love, you know, love the farm, love the homestead, love the land. Well, you have a book in your store by a different author, um, Green versus Screen, is it called? I probably had the title wrong. The blurb on it was uh, balancing screen time and green time, yeah. children being outside and being yeah. On well, the screen. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I mean. Um, Jenny, Jenny Urick has written in a thousand hours outside. That's what it is. Thousand hours outside. And um, and, and she's actually got a new one now out um, till the uh, whatever till the till the street lights come on or something like that. It, it's to the old oh, yeah. know, go outside till the street lights come on. Um, and, and so that's a that that I think is a is a that becomes a big issue uh, as you go forward. That tension if if one spouse really really wants the children to learn the work ethic and the responsibility of chores and 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 farm enterprises and that sort of thing and the other one wants to make sure they're at every you know library children's reading time and every ballet and and all that there's nothing wrong with that but um you know i i get questions from people well you know uh, we want to do it all well you can't you, do it. You, you can't, you, and you, you shouldn't. You, no, and you should. you're putting too much pressure That's on right. kids. That's right. That's right. You know, I, I came here a couple of hours early today to kind of prepare myself and just to walk around and enjoy it without a guided tour. And I noticed you have many, well, several children around here. They're playing, climbing mm-hmm. up in the barn. Yeah. It was really refreshing to see that. Mm-hmm. You, you don't see it anymore. You don't see kids riding their bicycles yeah. or, right. or sliding in the wintertime. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It brings me to one of my questions that was going to be later on, seeing how you brought up children, is um, the USDA and the FDA and the system in general. Um, you've talked about how they call our livestock the national herd mm-hmm. and our chickens the national flock. Mm-hmm. Like they have ownership over our personal right. property. Right. And there are some people in the government and society in general who view children as a property of the state and right. the society overall. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, which brings me to my question about homesteading. How, how important is it, do you feel, to, to keep children away from that mentality of people who right. say, say they own our children right, right, right. And, and homeschool them? And then how, and, and for the people who want to homeschool, how do you get them past that fear of how do you do it? You know? Yeah, and, and how... Um, and and the, generally the people who say uh, the state owns the child um, or or the child is a is a national asset, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, often their um, their their agenda uh, is a little different than mine, and uh, well, it so, seems to be quite an agenda of uh, indoctrination. <laughs> there is quite an agenda with a certain yeah. political bent yeah. to it. So my so my very. Um, Uncredentialed, unscientific, and uh, you know, um, I'm not a child psychologist. Okay, so I don't have a degree in this. But but here's here's my here's my opinion. My opinion is that self worth, and you know, we have a self worth crisis in this country. Our teen suicide rates up dramatically. Uh, um, we've got all sorts of of adolescent psychology problems. All right. And, and most of them stem from a bad self-image, you know, a, a, a self-identity and self-worth and self-value, uh, um, okay? I'm not valuable. Nobody, you know, nobody wants me. Nobody needs me. You know, what, what can I contribute? And so here's my, my phrase is self-worth comes from successfully accomplishing meaningful tasks, okay? All four I've, I've words. All four words. Before. Successfully yeah. accomplishing meaningful tasks. All those are important. So, so tasks are things that need to be done. 
projects and things that need to be done, not make work, not, you know, not, not silliness. Um, meaningful tasks means that they're important. Um, uh, so, you know, um, being the top points getter on Angry Birds is not meaningful tasks, okay? And then accomplishing, that means you're involved, you're doing it. You're not, you're not with your hands in your pockets, you're not, you know, uh, looking around while somebody else does the work. You're, you're off the bleachers, you're participating, you're in the deal, um, and then being successful. You can't, you're not going to get self-worth if you fail at everything you, you, you try. You've got to have, you've got to have success in these, in these meaningful tasks. And so, uh, so I, I actually, I actually do believe that um, that that a homestead offers the greatest. But and when I say a homestead, I mean a homestead mentality too. I mean, if you live in suburbia, you can have a big garden. You can have backyard chickens. You can can your own food. You can can your own food, yeah, even, if buy, even if you buy even if you buy bushels of it at the farmers market. Yeah. Okay. But it's the idea that. Uh, you're canning together, you're gardening together, you're milking the sheep, milking the goat, milking the cow, whatever. Uh, you're bringing in firewood. You're, you know, you're doing this stuff together, and and it's that it's that broad-based um, successful accomplishment of meaningful tasks that gives you your value, even if you don't succeed the first time. Right. It's like you're talking before. You know, when a child falls down as a baby, you don't say, oh, give up and just let it lay right. on the floor no, forever. That, no, that, you got to keep getting back up. That's right. Until you succeed. That's right. So mastery that, uh, definitely. Mastery always takes time and it takes, you know, and it takes repetition, repetition and time. Uh, mastery, that, that's what it takes. And, and, you know, when you think about it so often in our urban settings in America today, in our, in our, in our luxurious, you know, urban settings, um, Chill, almost um, chores don't come naturally to kids. I mean, you know, feed the dog, feed the cat, um, whatever. You know, I'll tell you. But, <laughs> and, and, and so you, so you, you have you have to actually try to think of things. You know, how do we make this happen? Well, it's amazing the lack of skills children have. Even teenagers. A, a few years ago, I had an ice cream shop, and I had probably twenty, fifteen to sixteen year olds working for me. And I literally had to sit them all down and teach them how to sweep. Mm, they right. didn't even know how to sweep. They were dragging the broom across the floor. Yeah. And I was like, how do you not know how to sweep a floor? I don't understand this. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's, it's kind of an odd thing. But the whole the homeschooling aspect of it, um, you know, Donna and I are going to be working on a book called Community and Immunity. So, uh -huh. for example, um, one example would be if you're building a community of homeschoolers, where maybe one parent is teaching one subject to a few kids and a, an, another parent down the road is teaching another to a few. You're, you're building that community. Uh, there is socializing. People don't think homeschool children oh. socialize, but forced association <laughs> is not socialization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big different thing. Yeah. But so they're building the immunity from the indoctrination, mm, right? Mm -hmm. So the yeah. book's going to be kind of based on that. And yeah. I find it, I, I wish everybody would just... I wish public schools would just close down. I yeah, really yeah, do. yeah. I, I'm with you, and 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 the point, uh, your point is, I love, I love the the juxtaposition of those two because because we want them to be immune, we want them to be immune from from a poor self image, we want them to be immune from, I'm not good at anything, uh, all that. We want them to be immune to that, and um, and and. The thing is, patting a child on the head saying, Johnny, you're a good little boy. Mary, you're a good little girl. That doesn't do it. No. Good, good, good for what? Good for what? You know? Yeah, and, everybody has to be useful. They, they, some everybody, everybody needs to feel needed. Uh, that's, like, that's like the foundational, the basis of, of, of self-worth and, and self-identity. And we, we saw this during the COVID shutdown. Mm -hmm. uh, for children who were homeschooled, it wasn't really a blip for them. They already had their social network. Right. They were being taught at home right. already. Right. And children in public schools, they were sitting at home. The only way they had to socialize was online. Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of bullying. And right. so a lot of that self-doubt and, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. um, not quite fitting in anymore right. and all that really developed into this cancerous yeah. type of uh, psychological problems right. for a yeah. lot of children right. in the last right. few years. You've just seen it explode. Yeah. 
Um, Absolutely. So anyway, you were talking about how many thousand people a year come through here? About 15. About 15,000. And you've been doing tours for what, about a decade anyway. So you've had tens of thousands of people come through here for tours mm -hmm. and for interviews and events. Has, I'm, I'm curious if anybody along the way has stuck out to you with their stories that were inspiring to you at all. Mm. Or even if not inspiring, just <laughs> something memorable that you're like, oh, wow, this is pretty interesting. Because I'm sure you must have heard thousands of stories. You know, we came from this yeah. country, we came from this state. Yeah. You oh, pondered my, over dude. some chocolate milk if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, goodness. Maybe there's I, nothing. I don't know. Well, well no, 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 there is. There, there, there's just so many. I can't, I mean, there's people that, that have come from, um, you know, Australia, Romania, um, I mean, there was a there was a young um, uh, hog farmer from China uh, that came during the during when you know when uh, that African African swine flu was coming up, and um, and he was a he was a young Chinese young forty-ish um, hog farmer in China, and uh, you you think hog farms in America are big? You ain't seen nothing until you see the ones in China. I mean, they're they're just they eclipse the U.S. And of course, they were having all this trouble. And um, he just smiled and he said, he said, uh, you know, we don't we don't we don't have any problem and don't even think about it. He had his pigs outside. He was rotating them with electric fence, moving them around. Um, and, and so, you know, there are people. So he's not worried about. Any flu? Yeah, swine because flu. they're immune, or they just yeah, eat no, them. Yeah, because, flu because anyway. they have a, they have a good life. They're not all cramped up in a big factory house, right? right. Um, okay. And I mean, it, it's just heartwarming to hear. So, I mean, you think about communist China, and you think nobody can think it. You know, nobody can do anything. Yeah, they're all. Yeah, nah, he was he was doing just fine. And he he said he's one of of numerous ones, kind of an under. You, know, you don't read about him in the Wall Street Journal, okay? But but there there is a definite you know undercurrent even in. Communist China, um, of of people that are doing things differently and thinking differently, and um, it probably and, stems a little bit from them pulling all the farmers into the city to work in the factories. These farmers that were on the outskirts doing a thing their own way, now they're right right off the city limits. You right. know, raising these pigs and they're yeah. doing it the right yeah. way, which I would have never guessed in a million years that yeah. they were doing that in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very heartening to see the level of of creativity and just kind of under the radar. You know, some of these guys were doing it was it was really really good. So you know that that kind of thing that kind of thing's exciting. Um, I mean, there are there are people. Planting trees, um, multi-species—you know, combining animals with vineyards. Um, yeah, I mean, every. I guess my problem here is everybody's interesting. I mean, I find everybody interesting, and I, I almost everybody has a has a story to contribute. You know, yeah. something um, that's that's going on. We've had, of course, we have a lot of people that come and they they want us to do something. Um, you know whether it's biochar or uh, uh, some you know algae foliar spray or you know some some new you know whatever and, um, and you know, they want us to use it and then and then love it and then I'll promote it and then you know be a millionaire um, <laughs> and, and and we get and we get a lot a lot of that. And, Which is uh, understandable. You understand that as an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, I understand but it. It but, can get old. Yeah, but it, it does. It does. It get, it gets old. And the thing is, experimentation is costly. Sure. You know, to actually to actually set up a true experiment. Yeah. With controls and 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 repetition and monitoring, and um, we've kind of come to the point where we pretty much have agreed we can only do about one one significant experiment a year that's about all we can handle and, and 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 continue the efficiency of everything that we're doing you know stay in business 
So, uh, I mean, we love everybody's ideas. We love, you know, we, I, I love to, to see and hear what everybody's doing. Um, uh, but, you know, we're just, we're limited as to how many, how many experiments we can take on at, at one time. It, it's uh, I, I think from my perspective anyway, I would assume that um, your tours are as a one-man play, as I like to call them. <laughs> And I don't mean that as an insult yeah, whatsoever. No, no, I, I take it as a compliment. Okay, yeah. good, good, because yeah. that's the way it's meant. Yeah, I, as, as, you know, I, I, when I when I go speak around the country, you know, I say no, th um, th this is not a presentation; it's a performance. Right. I, I like to think that it's you know it's a bit of a. Well, you got to grab the audience. Yeah. To get your point across. That's right. That's right. And, and when you're doing your tours, I, you know, I got to imagine that's a huge chunk of it is you're trying to inspire other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and spread the message while mm -hmm. while promoting yourself at, at the same time. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. How much joy do you take in those tours and meeting the people afterwards? So is so, it satisfying for yeah, you still after very, all these years? Uh, yeah, very much so. I I enjoy it um, because I we know we know that there's something magic when a person tastes it and sees it. Yeah. Taste it is good, see it is good, but if they taste and see, that's even better. And so, you know, it's one thing to say we have a farm that doesn't stink, uh, you know, our animals are happy, um, the fields are pretty, but when you actually get immersed in it and you see the contentedness of the animals and you actually go by the piggerators, you know, in the spring, the tours in the spring when we're piggerating and and you have, and I, I can go in there and I can scoop up that handful of, of compost and give it to the kids. You know, they all smell it. And, you know, that was poop just 30 days ago, you know. That yeah, was my wife's favorite part of the tour when you yeah. held it up for her yeah. to smell it. She yeah. absolutely, she yeah. smells everything. So uh -huh. it's, everything's about yeah. smell. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so and and so, so that's all part of the theater, you know, to, to, to engage and to help them to understand, you know, uh, this is different because if, if we can if we can ever get people to understand that I'm, I just said there's a good way and a bad way to farm, then most people are gonna are gonna jump on the good way. I mean they're gonna they're they're gonna really wanna they're gonna wanna fund the good way and defund the bad way. I mean and and that's that's what we're doing. You know our our mission statement here is to develop emotionally, economically, and ecologically enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. I mean, I'm on a world change mission. I, I want, and and so, you know, I don't have time to, to go and, and uh, whatever, um, um, be, a, be a sign carrier against stuff that I don't like. Um, be the change I, you want to see in the world. I, 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 want, to, I want to grassroots. Let, let, let's change the system from the ground up. There's nobody in the world you don't need a government agency. You don't need a bill. You don't need anything to quit, um, you know, uh, um, using drugs on your animals, uh, or 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 to build a compost pile, or to um, you know to steward your woodlot. You, know, you don't need you don't need a government agent. You don't need a law. You don't need anything. How crazy is it that we have to work and pay money and spend money to have something labeled organic? Yeah. And when it's yeah. made with chemicals and GMOs, it doesn't yeah. have to be labeled. Have, it should be the opposite that's, that's right. way around. Have, that's right. It doesn't have to be labeled uh, the other way. My grandfather yeah. on his farm did not call his food organic. It was yeah. just food. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to get no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So my point is that we don't need to ask permission to do what is right. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I'm just, my attention is can we get more people to do what's right? And and uh, and if we, I, I'm glad there are watchdogs and there are people, you know, um, picketing or whatever. They're you know writing letters, doing what they're um, or against fact, this or that. But you do have to have a little tiny bit of regulation. I do, just mm -hmm. a smidgen. But the free market, for the most part, will take care of that. You know, sure. if somebody gets sick sure. or dies, that farm's just going to shut down. Yeah. One of my friends, I told a few people I was coming here, not many. One of my friends goes, oh, I, I like what he's doing, but he's an arnicus. I, I says, no, he's not. He's just a libertarian. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not an anarchist, 
but but yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to wear the wear the hat of libertarian. I think I think I generally I think generally how do we you know how do you get people to make responsible decisions? How do you exercise the discernment muscle? You exercise the discernment muscle by allowing people to make choices. And if my only choice is what the government says I can have, then I'm going to I'm going to have an anemic discernment muscle because I don't have to make any choices. The government says it was fine. I don't have to know anything more than that. Yeah, that chicken safe. Yeah, that chicken safe got the government got the government seal on it. All is well. And so then I become more and more and more ignorant because somebody else has made all those decisions for me. But if I can actually choose a bad chicken, not to say that the government approved chicken is good. Right? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but it, it, you know, it, it, if I was responsible for those choices, guess what? I'd start learning how chickens are raised and what's done to chickens. And what company A does, and what company W does, and what company Z does, um, I, I would I would become uh, knowledgeable about that. And 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 so what's happened is we've we've dumbed down uh, the the populace to where nobody knows any of these you know background things. And 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 of course that frees us up to watch more football and you know Netflix yeah. and everything else. Well, that brings me to another point. Um, when I was growing up, we'd take trips up to my grandfather's farm. Mm -hmm. And along the way, I mean, I would say half the people on the way still had the remnants of victory gardens. Mm -hmm. And a quarter of the people had chickens in their yard. And this was the, the norm. And now society has been so dumbed down, so conditioned to go, okay, the U.S. duh and the F duh. <laughs> they know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, well, homesteaders who are not even living off the grid, but somebody just has some chickens in a garden, you understand why the system of the big farmers see that as a threat, because it's a, it's a threat to their bottom line financially, right? But what I can't understand, and maybe you can help me out with this, is the average person, somewhere in their subconscious, they see somebody in their yard now with 40 chickens or even 10 chickens and a big garden and they look at them like they're a lunatic farmer right. like they're a threat somehow to society mm -hmm. and i can't wrap my head around what makes them see their neighbor as a threat to to and, yeah into what really you yeah know? well i mean i mean first of all there's a threat on the on the chickens and things like that there's a threat of of um contamination they're gonna poop well it takes nine chickens to produce the same amount of poop as an average dog. Yeah, people right. don't mind people don't dogs, mind dogs cats, <laughs> and that poop is nasty. I mean, you can put a little bit of maple syrup on chicken poop and probably eat it, but dog poop, I mean, it is nasty. I don't man. know if I'd try that at all, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it. But, um, I mean, the, the difference has been between, rough, but not that rough. The, yeah, the difference between chicken poop and, and, and dog poop is pretty profound. I mean, dog poop is really nasty, so... So, uh, so you, you know, you've got that. You got this this completely jaundiced thing, and then the second thing is that you have a a, a cultural um, prejudice against farming um, because most of the backlash these kind of places is in you know gentrified upscale communities, yeah. and we don't want any of that around here. I mean, uh, you know, I got a call from a lady in Texas. She just had to pay a fine to her homeowners association because she had she had a tomato in her flower bed and a tomato is farming oh man and we don't want any farming around here that's what that's what brown people do that's what you know what i'm saying and i'm, yeah, I'm a man i'm not you know, i'm not i'm not being whatever prejudicial here at all i'm just saying that there is a that's there it, is that's a, their outlook yes that's yeah. their outlook no and 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 so there's this this prejudice um, that that farmers are kind of the you know the low life and nobody wants a wants a farmer to be um, to be next to them because they're they're D students they're C, they obviously weren't smart enough to get a real job like an attorney or a, an accountant or a you know IT professional so they're just farmers 
and mm -hmm. farmers are being relegated. So that's one reason why I promote so aggressively, um, you know, white collar farmers. You know, let let let's figure out how to have farmers that actually aren't the poorest church mice in the community, and um, and attract the best and brightest to farming. I mean, you know, we, we talk about our our first responders, yeah. okay, first responders. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to our natural resources, air, soil, water, farmers are our first responders. They are. Okay. Well. And hunters. Yeah. You know, Ted Nugent was talking about this. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he was mentioning in the early 80s, the water was so polluted in areas in Michigan and the land was, and the hunters were the ones that noticed what was going on and changed it. Right. And it's very similar, to push, the, you know, mm -hmm. Well, most hunters are farmers too. Or, yeah. You know, somewhat. Yeah. Or most farmers mm -hmm. are hunters, hunters, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most farmers are hunters. But sometimes yeah. I get the sense, Joel, that the, the at least the subconscious resentment that some have towards people who are are trying to be self sufficient, I don't even know if they realize it, but it's almost like a, a resentment that you're exercising freedom. <laughs> like, hey, I'm a slave. How dare you not be a slave? <laughs> How dare you not have to make ten dollars to have fifty percent of your money taken away in taxes to spend five on a dozen of eggs? When, you know, how dare you just raise your own eggs and not have to make ten dollars well, to do that? You know, there's a there, 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 there's there's a there's a victimhood uh, kind of um, you know persona in our culture right now that that um, that, that you can't allow, be allowed to be happy. You can't be allowed to be free if if you free yourself up from dependency on the on the system and this is the thing that i hear all from this homestead tsunami all the time is i just want to disentangle i just want to disentangle Spe and, and, speaking of that that's your 16th book right yeah that's, that's right. your new book i forgot to mention it yeah. homestead tsunami so we'll get that plug in there good thank you <laughs> didn't mean to you can pick up your, your commission flow. after the, okay, after the yeah. program <laughs> um so so you know do you want to disentangle and and i think i think this this disentanglement uh, mentality is is very bipartisan and throughout our culture right now uh, there is a huge lack of trust in all of our basic institutions i mean you know fauci destroyed our trust in the cdc um uh, you know the, the, the federal reserve system federal reserve the economy yeah, money. bidenomics is destroying our trust in the federal reserve um and that's not a diss against biden or democrats it's just it's just the, it's the, a this from me, just for the record, not from them, <laughs> but from me. <laughs> fair, fair enough. But you know, uh, the empty store shelves at COVID um, made people uh, concerned about the you know industrial food system. Are, are we not going to have enough food? I'm still trying to figure out what the run of toilet paper was about. Oh man, yeah, yeah, that was a big deal. You want to refill? Yeah, you, you'd, you'd think, you'd think that if you. Um, if you're not eating as much, you wouldn't be pooping as much. But uh, yeah, I thought in the beginning, I'm like, is this stuff about diarrhea? What's going on here? I can't get a roll of toilet paper anymore. I don't, I don't know what's going we on. We don't have a Sears <laughs> Roebuck catalog anymore, so you're kind nope. of stuck. And uh, well, anyway, um, there's but but there's this idea. There's it, but then you have this idea of of entrapment and victimhood. We we've cultivated in our culture. I think uh, an entrapment mentality. I, I can't. I can't get out of this. I can't. Uh, I'm. I'm. It, 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 it's over my head. I can't get out of it. And so when somebody does, when somebody you know crawls out of the matrix, there's like a resentment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a well. You there's know, a shared victimhood here. Yeah. 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 How, how, how'd you how, how'd you figure this out? Um, because if you figured it out, then I could figure it out, and that becomes a threat to it, it it pushes me into you mean i've got to make some hard decisions you mean i've got to do some and, and so we you know we don't like that and so people tend to tend to resent the, the folks that crawled out of the you know crawled up out of the system yeah i, I found it in my own life uh two years ago i i call it retire yeah you know i worked just as much as i ever did on my homestead building that but uh, so I've noticed a little bit of resentment in some people I know. Like, mm -hmm. how dare you not be working seven days a week, which I always have. Now I work seven days on my homestead. Yeah, yeah. You know, but 
I have a, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Not not understand it, but wrapping around my head around that mentality because I'd be happy for anybody that could escape. Yeah, yeah. So to speak. You right, know? right. Well, I mean, that's our that's our understanding. We we love every every step toward um, toward personal empowerment, self reliance, and, yeah. and and all that. But uh, man, doesn't it feel good on the soul, though, huh? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's it, it's one. I mean, listen. When Putin, when Putin invaded Ukraine and fertilizer jumped four hundred percent, and all the farmers were, oh no, you know we're we're gonna we're not gonna be able to make it because fertilizer went up. We're just we're laughing here. We, we don't buy any of this stuff, and so all that crisis and catastrophe and stuff, it didn't affect us at all. No, you were just concerned about toilet paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> like the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least we were just relegated to that, you know, and not anything else. But we weren't really, we weren't, we weren't concerned about, you know, fertility and and that sort of thing. And so, so the the liberty. Here's the thing that's important to understand: we have been sold a lie for several decades in this country that that if you just let the big corporations take care of you, you know, make your food, um, uh, get your energy. And and uh, uh, give you your pills for your you know your health problems and all that. Um, if you just let us take care of you, then you can go on your Caribbean cruises, watch Netflix, and, and have time for football, uh, the NFL. Okay, and, and and we were told that as if that was the you know that would free us from the mundane foundations of life like gardening and canning and milking a cow and cutting you, firewood. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's then, no spiritual fulfillment yeah, in that. Yeah, then really all of a isn't. sudden, here came the black swans of COVID, Putin, and 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 and, and suddenly, Biden, <laughs> and suddenly a lot of people realized, oh, what was promised me for freedom, actually enslaved me. Yeah, to a system. Yeah, and and that's part of what's fueling this whole disentanglement thing the, the point is if you want to be free if you really want to be free you have to participate in the mundane foundations of life you've got to cook from scratch procure your food not expect Campbell's soup to you know do it for you you have to um, you know participate in some chickens and some eggs and some you know maybe some butchery and and, and these uh, sewing and and these these skills these home centric skills that ultimately lead to lead to freedom freedom only comes with participation and we've been lied to that you don't have to participate anymore and you can be free well, that brings me to the youth you know as you know and you speak about the average age of a farmer right now is 60 right. and they're trying to move out of it and we're trying to bring young people in mm -hmm. and people like you and Paul from uh, Back to Eden and the people mm -hmm. of uh, Biggest Little Farm mm -hmm. with all the videos there are online of all of you, the, your tours that you do, the inspiration, the beautiful view when you come over the hill here <laughs> coming onto your property. I mean, it's just gorgeous. It's, it's, it's breathtaking. It really is. And it becomes romanticized, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you, you take a young person, say who's 25 or 30, and they go, wow, I really want to do that. But what they don't realize is the aggressive <laughs> patience that it takes. Yeah. Because yeah. they see a film like mm -hmm. Biggest Little Farm that's a seven-year project mm -hmm. condensed into an hour and 30 minutes. Sure. And they're getting a bushel of yeah. raspberries or whatever. They don't see... Okay, you've planted 50 raspberry bushes, and it's going to be three years before you get mm -hmm. a harvestable right. amount out of that. Right, right. So it's easy enough to romanticize and inspire the young generation to get into it, but how do we, while trying to inspire them, let them understand the aggressive patience that it takes so that if they do jump in, they don't get discouraged that they stay in because yeah. it's easy enough to get people to jump in anything. Sure. You know, sure. people are going to go to like, yeah. you know, uh, sip and paint class. Oh, I'm going to start painting. And yeah, fantasy, fantasy sells. 
yeah. fantasy selves, yeah. right? So how, how do you get and, them to know the reality? And I love your term, the the, the aggressive patience. I I'm, forget I'm, where I heard that recently. I just love that. Yeah, term. I love that phrase. That is that is really powerful. My mentor, Alan Nation, uh, used to say, uh, "You have to uh, you have to enjoy the slog, the slog. The, the slog has to be enjoyable to you." And and so, um, so. You know, we live in a time of instant gratification. I mean, everything. Well, if you, you know, if if the game doesn't give you a new car after you wrecked your, you know, on your video game, if it doesn't give you that in, you know, in in three seconds, you know, a pox on this. I mean, you know, the average, uh, the the um, in in websiting, you know, you you have to um, attract people's attention in like, you know, ten seconds. That's that's it. Yeah. Or or they're gone. So we have this kind of instant gratification thing and um, and I, I, I think I think obviously it takes a certain character a certain personality uh, to be able to, to do this and we certainly see this you know I'm I spend a lot of time with young people we have these stewards Your we interns, have these apprentices, right? apprentices. and uh, and our, our staff is young what would you say the percentage of your apprentices who follow through with it later in life are yeah um, Compared to you know what come through here. Yeah, yeah, you know we, we probably have a, a, an apprentices. We probably it's probably you know about seventy percent. Really that um, high? Yeah, but with stewards, you know, with stewards it'd probably be. Well, what, what's the know, difference between an apprentice months. and a steward? So a steward comes for five months. Okay. That's May one to September thirty. All right. And that uh, and the mission statement for them is uh, to immerse here for a season and find out if you have what it takes to be a farmer. Part of that is aggressive patience, okay? Then for the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship then, those apprentices come out of the stewards and they're here now for another year, October 15 to October 15. Following their stewardship. No gap, they just jump right into it? Uh, well, it was a two week gap, two so they can go gap. home and get winter clothes and, <laughs> right. know, and t say hi to everybody. Right. And then they come back for a year and, uh, and, and, and they then become the first level managers of the next year's steward team yeah okay um and and you know so the stewards so, become so, the apprentices who train the stewards the yes year. yes so there's, a, just there's a, yeah there's a cycling out so and it sounds so, like so that's so the, the solution really yeah, so, so the mission statement of the apprentices is to learn the polyface way and be able to duplicate it anywhere in the world yeah and so that you know there so one is to find out do you have do i have what it takes is this something i enjoy and i like and then the second then is really drill down in the in the, the protocols and the mechanics of, of, of actually uh, getting it done, and, um, and so that's why there's you know there's a difference in, in I think the, the who you know who takes this and runs with it, but um, so a good way for a young person who's really thinking about it is to do a stewardship or an apprentice ab on, absolutely on the farm. yeah 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 absolutely do do, do something um, try and, it out and, and you have to find the time. The time element it takes, whether it's you know digging a post hole, uh, putting up hay, whatever, um, uh, you know, find out. Do you enjoy? Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy the the time element to that? You know, well, can you at least tolerate it enough? Yeah, where the payoff is enjoyable yeah, enough. Growing right? a chicken, I mean, because well, digging pencil pencils no, is no. Uh, it's, it's who one enjoys of the reasons that? Yeah, yeah. It's one. It's one of the reasons. Um, you know that I a lot like um, the the meat chicken uh, is because the meat chicken, um, you know, is an eight week, so you can kind of see the whole process pretty pretty quickly and and go through the process. Um, obviously, uh, growing a garden, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't speed up a beet. I mean, they're, they got to grow and they've got to mature and, um, and just to understand that, that, that biology has these, um, this time constraint and, and, and it's, it's on its own time schedule. That really hits home because we had a lot of heat and we had a lot of rain. Mm. This year uh, in New Hampshire, it was the most rain in like 50 years or something like that. Mm. And everybody thought their gardens were dead. They ripped them up. We left ours and we found all it did is delay it like a month. We're just like, let's just see what happens because uh, nature yeah. is forgiving. That's right. You know, that's right. Nature will adjust. That's right. Almost always. And then it came it all over. 
Yeah, most of the stuff came up afterwards. The tomatoes, mm -hmm. they were a month after they normally would have. The cucumbers were like a month afterwards. You mean they just didn't even sprout? No, we the, had... The seeds, and it was, just, it was cold too, apparently. No, it was really hot and really rainy. Hot and rainy. Hot and rainy this summer, and it, it just kind of like put everything on pause. Oh. It was really strange. Wow. Except for where we didn't plant. In our compost piles... Mm -hmm. And where seeds just fell on the ground here and there, we had tomatoes and squash and pumpkins all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Donna, did we plant pumpkins over here? No, what the hell? Why do we have all these pumpkins and squash? And poor Donna, our first year of gardening, you know, she tried to, she had a horrible time growing tomatoes, I mean, uh, cucumbers out of anything. And we go on hikes and you'll see this random rock with a tree growing on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. tease her, look, yeah. this is growing yeah, the harshest, <laughs> The harshest environment in the world, and nobody planted it, and there it is. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so that's it, right. It does take patience, and you can't mm -hmm. get discouraged. And yeah. um, I think you're right, you know, a good a good uh, summer of apprenticeship or a stewardship or a mm -hmm. season to... Volunteer with test. somebody. So Volunteer with there somebody. There ain't a farm in the world that is going to accept somebody coming in and vol yeah. saying, hey, I want to... Can I help you out? I want yeah. to see if this was it about. Yeah, yeah. But another thing with uh, young farmers, and I've seen a basic theme, especially in the Midwest, with a lot of young farmers in the 30s and 40s, and uh, I'll kind of consolidate a lot of the stories into one, is a guy starting up a farm, he buys 500 acres, he goes to the bank for a loan for a quarter million dollars for a machine. The bank says, no, we ain't going to loan you a quarter million, but here, if you build a barn, you do this, we'll loan you two million. Mm -hmm. So he's like, wow, if someone's going to loan me two million dollars, I'll make X amount. A few years down the road, he finds, okay, well, I'm making money. Well, my money's going to the bank, right? So he does the math, and he figures out, well, I, I need 1,500 or 2,000 acres and more of a loan. Mm -hmm. So then he takes out more of a loan. To try to make a living, past what he's paying the bank, past his employees, and then what he's finding is the only thing he's making money on is the subsidies, usually from corn in the Midwest, mm -hmm. right? Or a guy in Michigan I know he gets he gets paid by the government not to milk his cows, right? It, it's a com it's complete insanity. Yeah, I, I'd love to see all subsidies just yeah. disappear. But well, the, I'd, like, I'd like to see the USDA just, just go away. I mean, no government agency has ever been more successful at annihilating its constituency yeah. than the USDA. And all they're doing is keeping their corrupt system that they messed up since the 50s in place to justify right. their jobs and their paychecks and their pensions. Right, right, right. Because right. they're like, here's subsidies for the corn. Keep growing the corn that nobody wants, mm -hmm. that's unhealthy for the cows. But yeah. these young guys, you know... Now they're in debt. They're, mm -hmm. they're, or, or they take loans from people like Tyson. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to set you up with your barn, your machinery. You have to grow your chickens this way. So you get, you get these gentlemen and, and women that are very discouraged. They're, and they're kind of embraced it because that's their misery. They have to accept their misery, embrace it, and do the best crowd possible. But they hate it. So, you know, barring going bankrupt, which is, in my mind, the only solution they have, how do they transfer themselves out of that situation? How do they, you know, how do, how do they um, get to a point where they, they become the farmers they want to be yeah. versus just being a guy who's operating a, a machine to right. harvest GMO corn yeah, that's going to go into every food yeah. as corn syrup and into right. cows? right. So, so I mean, I don't, Sorry, I don't have, yeah, that's fine. I don't have a magic <laughs> recipe, uh, but, but let, let's take, you know, Farmer John that's got this huge acreage. He's in debt up to his eyeballs, can't see his way out of it, and he wants to make a change. So the first thing he's got to do is he's got to take the pressure off of his financial situation. So I know it's, I know it's completely um, unorthodox and sounds like, you know, heresy to say, but a lot of these big operations, if they're in that phase where they're they're wanting to get out, they need to sell a bunch of land to to get liquidity, to get to get out of their financial treadmill, 
and give them a little bit of breathing room to be able to try something new. Um, you know, trying new things is, again, experimentation is costly in time and money and all that. And it's a big gamble right, for right. a guy big, who's still trying gam- to support yeah. his yeah. young wife and a young yeah. baby yeah. and big gamble. So, pay the bills. Yeah. So, so a couple principles. Number one, the bigger the operation, the harder it is to turn. It's a lot easier to turn a speedboat than an aircraft carrier. Yeah. Okay. So, so the bigger the operation, the more difficult it is to make a change. Okay. Uh, which you know, and so the bigger the the bigger the financial pressure or tension, the harder it is to extract. The harder it is to make a change. And they want to make the change because I've seen a lot of these podcasts with these guys that are stuck, mm-hmm. and there's nothing more they crave than to want to. Yeah. Farm. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But but a, but what a, they're doing's not farming. But a farm, a farmer and his land, are uh, that's his identity, and and yeah. farmers farmers almost would rather go bankrupt than sell off, you know, forty percent of their farmland to give them freedom. So where where I'm going? So the next principle, the second big principle is that you have to be able to do embryonic experiments okay and i run into this a lot with um in families with succession you got dad and mom you know old generation you got the kids coming on kids want to try some new things dad and mom won't let them well, dad and mom, they, they're stuck in their way well but dad and yeah. mom afraid that this idea is going to bankrupt the farm yeah and the kids say well they won't let us try anything and dad says well if i do you're gonna lose it you know and and so you've got so one of the, the the key elements is to look at them both and say, so Dad, how much acreage can Junior here have uh, that you feel comfortable with that won't jeopardize the farm? Two acres, five acres. Today? Give me a number, okay? Then you look at Junior and say, okay, Junior, I know you want more. This is what Dad's willing to to offer. Whatever experiment you want to run. It's got to be done at this scale. Can't be done at big scale. It's got to be done at this scale. Yeah. So, Dad, thanks for giving a number that Proof Junior concept. That, that Junior can play with. Junior, you got to be satisfied with this and do your proof of concept on this. Yeah. And uh, you know whether it whether it's he uh, kind of did that with Daniel with yeah, the yeah, rabbits, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. Whether it's successional or not, um, the 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 point is that you, as you're doing this. You have to you have to do enough prototypes to get your own confidence level up. A lot of these guys, you know, they they know they don't like what their situation is, but they've been so embroiled in that they haven't really done enough. Whether it's substituting compost for ten 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 chemical fertilizer, or substituting, you know, taking some land out of corn and soybeans, putting it in grass, and doing some controlled grazing. Or taking something and doing some direct marketing, okay? They, they they haven't they haven't done any of that, and so you have to do that at a scale that doesn't jeopardize the mothership. Yeah, that's tough. That, that, that it, that's it, tough because it, it, it these is. guys are they're indentured servants to the banks. It, essentially, it, it, it is. It point. is. Which is why I started with first you have to you have to get off the treadmill. You have to free yourself up, and if that means selling some land, sell some land. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you're 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 being freed up financially to try some things. I'd say a large part of it too, though, would be to get over the fear of others seeing you as a failure. Mm. Like you said, sell the land. Who cares what your neighbor or your buddy down the road thinks? Right. You know, it's not a failure if you're making the right decision yeah. and doing what's best for for you. Your finances, your yeah. spirit, your soul, yeah. Yeah. right? But but it, but if you if you have any wiggle room at all, and you know I'm a farmer, man, trust me. I mean, the, I would rather die almost than sell an acre. Okay, so I I get that. So if you have any wiggle room at all, then do a couple of little prototype experiments on something that you're yeah. that you're thinking about. And if they work, keep and, doing and, it. and if if they it, work, just gradually start start uh, going into it. And again, you know, none of these things, you didn't get where you are in a day, you won't get out of it in a day. Um, but 
but the 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 time to start is today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, on the subject of these big farms, not necessarily, I'm not talking about the corn people. It, it, we're talking about livestock. Mm -hmm. We all know the culprits. Uh, when we were here for the tour, you were talking about they're taking now. They're doing experiments, taking out some type of stress gland in the animals, in the pigs, in the pigs, so that they don't feel stress when they're being abused, essentially, yeah, yeah, right? Right. And <laughs> it, it almost like in their mind, they think if the animal isn't stressed, it's not abuse. Right. And we've all heard the stories. We've seen the film footage of these fat animals with their legs breaking underneath mm -hmm. them, and uh, in a foot of their own dung. Right. You know. Right. And, and when do we as a society hold these people account for what is clearly animal abuse? Because, you know, we talked about being good stewards of the land, which includes being good stewards of the livestock. And then in his degrees, you have a farm like yours that's exceptional of how well your animals are treated. And then you've got an average farm where yeah. they're not abused, but, you know, yeah. they don't maybe have the top tier grain mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and room and then you get to the other end of the spectrum where anybody with a rational mind and a set of eyeballs so this so, gets me so, angry because it really hurts yeah, my soul when yeah. I see these, these animals being yeah. it's clear abuse looks at that and says this isn't right and, and yeah. like in your book here Homestead Tsunami could you imagine keeping children or even cats man you, you see these <laughs> stories in the news you know a lady's got like 40 yeah. cats in her house yeah 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 and but <laughs> In the same amount of space, you could have 10,000 chickens or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how are these people not put in jail? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Well, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a cultural, these are pets and these are farm animals. And, and, and so, so the bottom line is that we have, we have in our, in our, culturally, we, uh, our Western reductionist, linear, compartmentalized, disconnected mindset has, has um, relegated life to fundamental mechanics yeah. as opposed to biology. Yeah. And once you start seeing the animals like you always say like that. Yeah. And so once you start seeing life as fundamentally mechanical, then you see it as a pile of widgets, you know, a inanimate pile of protoplasmic structure to be manipulated <laughs> however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it. And so so it so that takes away all the the moral and ethical dimensions that no you know if, if i set a, a piece of wood up here there's and I, nobody there's no moral or ethical dimension on how i carve on that log right i mean it, no, it's just a log it's just a okay log. but but if i set a chicken up here there is a moral and ethical dimension on how i interact or a tomato plant or anything else. When, when, when we're interacting with biology there is an ethical moral dimension on how we how we interact with that being that life form and so the problem is that as a culture we have demeaned um our 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 life to the to the to this mechanical place and 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 what that has created now over the last several decades is a is a is a more aggressive violent disrespect to the pigness of the pig the chickenness of the chicken the the tomatoes and the tomato. Do you think that's a, a a whole as a society, or do you think they're ignorant to the fact of the farmers who treat the animals like that keep it very well hidden, and that's their mentality? I I think no. I I think it's um. I don't think it's a conspiracy or an evil intent. I think it's just a, um, a a lack. And you think I, the average I, person I, I, knows I, what's going on in these factories? No, I, I don't. I don't think they. I don't think they do. The average person, they don't want to know. All right, they, they you know, ignorance. They're not is bliss. asking questions. Yeah, ignorance is bliss. I don't want yeah. to know. But but I think as far as an industry, the, the goal there is just can we make them? Can we make it fatter, faster, bigger, cheaper? You know that that's all it is. There's no there's no real nobody's asking at at Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, Michigan State. Nobody's asking. Uh, how do we make pigs happy? <laughs> Nobody's asking that. See, well, I wish it would at least. How how can we make them not less? How can we make them less miserable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so even so, go to the happy route. Right, just like... right, right. So, so what's happened 
because because we have refused to ask that question and it and have not taken an interest in it what's happened is our food system is is beginning to fight back i mean you're old enough to know when you know, when we were kids and we were five-year-olds and we had a birthday party moms didn't have to spend two days asking the other moms of the kids who were coming to the what food allergies their kids had. Yeah. We just, everybody brought food, we ate they it. They didn't bleach everything. They no. Killed the peanut butter on the counter. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and so we have this new lexicon now of, you know, food allergy, Campylobacter, Listeria, um, high path avian influenza, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, you know, mad cow. We've got all this stuff. We didn't hear that when we were kids. None it, it. It, it didn't even exist. No. And, and and we almost didn't even know a diabetic or a fat person. I mean, everybody knew who the fat guy was and the fat lady was. You yeah. Know? But, but but there was They're a couple all fat of them. Now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and well, so. Then, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So 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 the, the, the so the point is the point is that this new lexicon this new lexicon of of of, of problems that we have are a direct result of a non-biological view of biology to life. Yeah. So to I assume we're on the same page as they'll probably never be held to account. So the only way to really change that is the individuals starting to raise their own chickens and basically boycotting these yeah. SOBs well, into bankruptcy. I like the word defund because because this is this is the age of defunding. Oh right, right. yeah. Defund so everything. so if we're going to defund something, let's defund Monsanto, let's defund Tice, and let's defund McDonald's, and um, and, and take all that and fund, you know, positive. Speaking of those guys, <laughs> so I I know you've had conversations with those companies, with their proxies at the USDA and the FDA who all have, they're in and out of the mm. revolving door. So this is a two-part question. Okay. Have you ever had a conversation with any of the higher-ups of these companies? And if you have, how'd that go? And if you haven't, if you had an opportunity to sit down, opportunity to sit down uh, with the higher-ups, say at Tyson or Hood, what would you, and you had like an hour to talk to them, what would you try to say to them to try to, make them see the error of their ways and maybe inspire them to change? So I have had um, some conversations with some higher ups of some large companies. And the only question that I have ever asked that seems to, whatever, get traction is the question, does God care? You ask them that. I ask them that, yeah, yeah. does God care? I mean, now obviously, you know that gets traction if a person, if a person has some sort of a Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, but you know, biblically, um, you know, uh, Jesus told the disciples, he says, you know, um, God knows when a sparrow falls. Yeah. He's interested in that. God knows when the number of hairs on your head. Uh, he's interested in that, and. Um, and he said, you know, Solomon in all his glory, uh, Solomon was the zenith of the, you know, the, the Israel um, experience, um, is not as, as beautiful as a lily of the valley, a flower. A little flower is more beautiful than Solomon in all his glory and his, you know, gold tower, you know, ivory thrones and, and, and all this. I'd agree with that. <laughs> so so, so, um, so it, it, it's quite clear to me, even a cursory view of this is, well, God cares. And has that been their response to you? It stops them in their tracks if if they have a, a, a heart for this. Yes. Yeah. And yes, it has been it has been extremely well received. That's the only thing when I say get traction. I mean where where you, you know where oh you see yeah. something going on on yeah. the inside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I'm yeah. all I'm always looking for the. For the end, you know, what's the question that can that can make somebody, whatever, you know, just stop in their tracks, stop in and their tracks, and, and not just not just you know go on with their normal uh, uh, thing, and and that that's the one that has done it. That's the one that has done it. Um, 
But I mean, yeah, they're. I mean, like Monsanto. I mean, they, they their web page, their home, you know, web page. We're the, you know, we're the repository of sustainable agriculture. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and most of them are so steeped in the idea that if people farm like us, half the world would have to starve to death because we know we can't produce do, the food like. Do like you think we, they believe it? Do you think yeah. they believe that oh, they're yeah. feeding the world, or? Oh yeah. Do, do you think? Oh so? yeah. Oh yeah. So do do they believe they're doing it healthily? Or they're like, well, everybody's sick, but at yeah. least they're alive. Uh, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that health ever enters the because they're, the they're making money on the it, back it, end with the medicines. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, and, and you know, you got you got the the overlapping boards of directors for these companies. Um, no, I think I I don't find it beneficial. And this is where I disagree with a lot of my you know my um, ecological minded friends. Um, I don't find it helpful to assume evil intent of anybody. Eh, maybe Bill Gates, but 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 uh, other basically, I'm assuming that Monsanto, that you know Bayer, that Tyson, that oh, well. their their intent their intent is good. That their intent is good. They want to do well. They want to feed the world. They want food for everybody to to enjoy. Well, what and about live. malignant neglect? Isn't it on par with having a, a less than pure motive? I mean, these guys have to be sitting up in their towers aware what their system is doing to people's health. And if they continue that... I, well, see, I'm, I'm not sure that they're aware of it. I, I, I think, I mean, look at look at what we've been told. I mean, look at Man, look at what the U.S. duh has told us over the years. Yeah. Um, you know, look, look at look at what science has told us. Science told us to to not eat lard and mar and uh, butter and eat uh, margarine. Don't eat red meat. Don't eat red meat. We were told to to, to pat our kids' hair with DDT. You know, uh, we were told to um, you know the the food pyramid of 1979. Um, you know, put um, uh, put uh, Twinkies and Cocoa Puffs on the on the foundation of it. Um, antimicrobial soap. And we were told to antimicrobial soap. Boy, that didn't last long. Um, it's kind of redundant. But. Yeah, uh, <laughs> genet genetic, genetically modified organisms. You got to have. I mean, goodness, the the world. <laughs> the world. Um, all the ag experts. Yeah, finish that off. Uh -oh. Oh, you finish it off, man. <laughs> um, think think about. Um, you can keep the bottle. Think about, uh, um, you know, Mad Cow. I mean, here, the, the world literally, all of them came together for 30 years, took farmers like me to free dinners to teach us this new scientific method of feeding cows. The whole intent was, you can raise it cheaper this way. We feed, we grind up dead cows, we feed it back to cows, and it's cheap protein, and the cows will do well, you know? And um, and, and I think all those people were, were really... Um, trying to feed people better and and I think I think their intentions were good Originally. and, and, and that, that's why that's why that's why the philosophy is so important the philosophy is what's so critical because it, 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 it's the philosophy that gets you you know and that's why I deal with this this biology versus mechanics so much is because as soon as you dismiss life, from biology and say, well, it's just mechanics. That is a philosophy. That's a philosophy that sends you down this this slippery slope of of um, you know. There's no there's no reason to make a happy pig. We just it's just a pile of protoplasmic structure. And of course, that same philosophy is driving now the whole you know fake meat uh, uh, lab meat craze. Yeah. So we don't have to kill animals. Nobody will have to kill anything. Well, the fact is, way more things are killed growing the soybeans, the sugar beets, and the corn to feed the fake lab meat than, than the animals that make the meat in the first place. Um, and, and it's kind of like with the avocados. Yeah. How many thousands upon thousands of animals you have to kill versus yeah. one cow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It, it, yeah, it, exactly, exactly. So, so, so again, the, philo the, the, the philosophy is we can have life without death. <gasps> Wouldn't it be if we had life without death? Well, the fact is, 
You can't have life without death. Good luck with that. Yeah, it, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't work. And, and so it's a philosophical, uh, um, a philosophical abridgment. Well, listen. Uh, if, if you don't have the death, so that something can live, how can you really put a value on what's living? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. Right. Because then right. it's just another, like you said, it's just another. That's right. So, uh, so, thing. so, 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 yeah. So, how you make the death, a la sacrifice, how you make that sacred, is how you respect and honor the being in life before the death. Yeah. And there's nothing sacred about a Tyson chicken dying. That's just, that's just putting it out of its misery. <laughs> that, 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 that sacrilege, that sacrilege sacrifice. Sacred sacrifice is a chicken that's honored and allowed to express its chickenness and that it's, it's honored in life, then that death becomes an actual sacred Yeah, sacred you're sacrifice. putting the Tyson chicken out of his misery, but you're causing the misery. Yeah. Not you, but the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, humans. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's right. You know, in a lot of these things, and in life in general, Joe, I've learned, and it took me a lot of years to kind of hone in on this, is... You know, we're spirits in a body and we have souls. And certain things will hurt your soul. Like, for me, it's um, seeing how these animals are treated. There's a lot of things. Injustices in general really mm -hmm. affect me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned in the last few years, dramatically, especially while we're building our homestead, is listening to my spirit of... If my spirit's tensed up, I'm doing something that that's God, a built-in mm -hmm. whatever it is. Radar, God telling like a us, radar, yeah, the radar yeah. Mm -hmm. saying, okay, this right. is the wrong way. Go over this right. way. Mm -hmm. So in the years that you've been doing this, uh, in nature, with nature, mm -hmm. and all your animals, what have you been able to observe um, about God's character? And his ways mm. within nature and yeah. animals, and and because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you've gone through that over the years. Like sure. you've gone away, and you know you fought hard, 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 and after he's like, "Why did I even bother? I should have <laughs> listened to my spirit in the first place that was yelling at me. Don't go that yeah. way." Yeah, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Can you? Well, yeah. So, share with so us something? yeah. So I would say first of all that God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. And whenever I have um, subverted, inverted, adulterated, abrogated <laughs> uh, um, order, then then uh, things things fall apart. Um, and and um, I, I can give an example. Please of, do. We we tried we tried for a couple of years to do uh, artificial insemination in our cows. Yeah, big mistake, big problem, and and as I thought more and more about it, I realized that you know uh, in artificial insemination. So you know when people say AI to me, they're always thinking artif you know, artificial artificial intelligence. intelligence. <laughs> I'm always thinking either artificial insemination or or uh, avian influenza. Right? Okay. So so um, what I've come to realize is that in artificial insemination, they've got these bull studs or, or whatever. And you tried that here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We bought some semen, right, mm -hmm. and tried it, and big mistake. And what I realized is that in the, in the stud outfits, for example, one, one bull service, um, they create a hundred straws out of that. Yeah. Okay? Well, think about that. That's that's 99 calves that would not exist that, that are from sperm that got beat out by the by the top guy all right so one of those calves yeah that makes a calf all right but all the others are from second best third best fourth best all the way down to 99th best sperm that would have been beat out that wouldn't have done the impregnation in nature and so, so there, there is so an order. So they're not going to have the good the, as immune system. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's this, there's this order, and people say, well, well, goodness, uh, well, then we wouldn't be able to do this, that, or the other. Okay, well, that's fine, 
and then I ask a Jurassic Park question, well, just because we can, should we? Right. And, 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 and so, the so is yeah, definitely yeah. no. <laughs> so that, that that that's one. That's one. Another one certainly is just the idea of forgiveness. So, um, ecologists would have called this resilience. How do we build? What you're trying to do is build shocks into it. And I, I like the term forgiveness because shocks do come. You know, blizzards and and droughts and 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 fault floods and hot and cold and all this does come. So how do we take a farm, a landscape situation like this, and build in forgiveness, shock absorbers, to make it, make it to where, um, you know, if, if in our relationship we have a lot of forgiveness in it, I can say some hard things and you'll be fine. You can say some hard things and I'll be fine. Like saying I'm married up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say the unforgiving thing would be to say I'm married down and she still love you. Okay. Right. That would be a very forgiving relationship. Right. All right. <laughs> I mean, you're accurate. I got to give you that, but it took me two years to convince her that she married up and you ruined it with one sentence. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm never going to forget it, <laughs> but I'll forgive you. Okay. Good. So, so, so the point is, um, uh, as we've as we've looked at how do we how do we, you know, build these shock absorbers forgiveness into our landscape, you know, that's one reason why we've built ponds and we have our irrigate you know our irrigation and our water systems, and and um, you know, moving the cows around uh, all the time, you know, that's that's. That that's resilience. That's that's forgiveness. And so, you know, I want people to come and visit and then drive out and say, "Oh, okay." So that's what forgiveness looks like. Wow, it can take a lot of. A and lot that's of not shots. to be mistaken with weakness on nature's part. Yeah, because it is resilient is powerful. Yes, yes. And so is forgiveness. Yes, yes. Right? Very much, very much so. Um, you know, a, a, another one certainly is just abundance. Abundance. You know, we live in a time. Where everybody's everybody's all fixated on scarcity. We're running out of this, running out of that, running. You know, Bill Gates says half of us need to die in order for the humanity to survive. He ought to go first. Yeah, he, he sure really definitely it. ought to go first. Um, and so, and his own accord, of course. <laughs> just, I just want to throw that in. Well, is, <laughs> Cover voluntarily, my ass voluntarily. voluntarily exercising uh, exercising choice as a consenting yeah. adult. Bill, be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so this abundance, and so you know, as a kid here, as a kid here, I, I could walk the whole farm, and never and never set foot on a piece of vegetation. That's how barren it was. You know, we had ten cows and couldn't really uh, feed ten cows. Well, you, you know, I've heard you talk about that, and they drive in here. It made me curious both times I've driven in here that. Your neighbors have seemed to have quite a fertile land. What was it about this chunk of land when your parents moved here? What happened to it? Why was it so... So bad? So bad, yeah. Did the previous owners just destroy it? it? Okay, so it was... So this this piece of land was absentee owned and leased from about 1914 to 1949. Okay. So for 35 years... It was leased to other people, and if you know much about leased farmland, rented farmland, it generally they don't much care. Yeah, they they don't take care of it very well. Yeah, and I mean when we came, the old timers in the area told us stories about. Uh, of course, you know they they were telling on on neighbors, on other friends. Yeah, you know they they used to you know buy the go half and half on fertilizer for example or around here they say fertilize we're going to buy some fertilize and uh and no r no r no r see, see no. i'm up in doing it we put the r on everything yeah, so r on okay. everything yeah 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 <laughs> like i have a good idea yeah an idea yeah 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 that's right that's right so so yeah so here it's fertilized you're gonna buy some fertilize and uh and so those years um the folks who owned the property would pay half and the farmer who leased it would pay half and then but he wouldn't put it on the. He wouldn't put it on here. He put it on his place. Uh, Those kinds of things, and that yeah, that yeah. that went on and on and on and on. 
And so it, it was definitely the most abused um, they used know, to ar- ar- armpit yeah, of the community okay. uh, during those years. And, and we're talking about, you know, the Depression. We're talking about uh, the Dust Bowl years. You know, we're talking about early, early mechanization, you know, where you could really plow up and abuse some ground. So do you have any current neighbors still alive that were here back that time and have seen this transformation? No, they're all gone now. Sadly, huh? They're all gone now. I mean, we've been here now 60 years. Now, your mother, she's still with you, she's right? She's still here. She's soon to be 100, she right? She'll be 100, yeah. Now, she's seen the transformation. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. when your dad was with you, mm-hmm. but in, since he's passed, even more so. Oh, oh, it's, yeah. Does, is it, does she still... Is she used to it, or does it still overwhelm her when she looks back at how it all started to what it is today? Yeah. I mean, she must be so proud of you. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think she's aware of it. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, for being 100, yeah, yeah. maybe, yeah. Well, she, yeah, but she doesn't remember much right Right, <laughs> right. But, 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 I mean, I'm the one that, that really can, can tell it, because I remember as a kid, you know, having these big uh, rock, shale galls in the fields uh where it was just just shale rock and there was no no grass no weeds no nothing and um and and i can remember as a kid you know tipping out the little um concrete tires that dad made with a little half inch pipe and we'd roll those out and and stick the electric fence stakes in them because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes and i've heard you speak on this and that's always made me curious um, the first few years that you, you were doing the system of bringing the cows to graze, mm-hmm. then bringing the chickens behind, mm-hmm. which, by the way, I saw all these little blackbirds near your cattle mm-hmm. earlier. That was amazing to see. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is exactly what Joel's yeah. always talking about in mm-hmm. nature. So what were the cows initially grazing on, or did you just well, strictly yeah, I mean, use there, there were There, the there were grass patches. There, there were certainly areas that had grass. I mean, it wasn't all rock. Yeah. I just remember these big, you know, these big saucer-shaped galls, you know, quarter acre here, quarter acre here, quarter, because, you know, we're, we're in this rolling land, and, and the shale, the shale lies in, 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 in uh, ledges, strata like this, so, you know, this, this ledge right here might be all rock, but right here, you might have some, you know, two feet of dirt, yeah. okay, and then, all right, and so it was. It, that's kind of the way it is. So I mean, yeah. So you, did you, the covering take care of itself over time? Yeah, and, and gradually I washed these big round galls every year. About eighteen inches would would come in. Eighteen inches, eighteen inches. That dramatic. That dramatic. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and but I mean, when you got a quarter acre, eighteen inches isn't all that <laughs> much, you know. Uh, and so so I remember the last one actually kind of you know actually closing up. Oh, probably. Um, I mean, eighteen inches though. That is dramatic. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. see it visually, but that's a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's a lot. Um, probably about about twenty years ago, the last one closed up, which which took forty years. So you've had a full landscape for twenty years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's still thin. You know, it's yeah. not thick, yeah. but it's you know, and, and you can really see it as soon as we if we get into a drought. Um, you can, you can, I mean, you can still see them just exactly like I remember them as a kid, you know, because they get dry soon, because well, yeah. they don't, they're not, not as deep. Every every good farmer, homesteader, inspirational guy out there like you and Paul, mm. um, I don't know, what's the other one? Biggest Little Farm. I have a hard time remembering people's names. Yeah, that's John. John. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, you got Elliot Coleman, you got... It, it's all about ground cover. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, our work. We're doing wood chip garden. Mm-hmm. We're taking what works. And here's another thing, is about trying to inspire young people. Mm-hmm. Is people will watch your video or Paul's or uh, Mr. Allen up in Wisconsin. Uh-huh. There. Will Allen? Will Allen. Yeah. He's a great yeah. inspiration. Oh, yeah. Yeah, isn't he? I, yeah. I had a heart attack a few years ago, so I, I have uh-huh. a little problem. Uh-huh. With my okay. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, you're all such inspiration to so many but, some people will watch and go, I have to do it this way. Mm. Like at our homestead, we're doing a little bit of you. We're doing a little sure. bit of Paul. So we're doing wood chips for the yep. garden area. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the chicken run, which mm-hmm. will turn into grass. Mm-hmm. But there's one fend- fundamental between all of you. Well, except Will, because he's in a hoop house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, um, yeah. you know, ground cover. Ground cover, ground cover. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just cover the ground, yeah. and most things will be all right. Because without ground cover, 
you're not going to have worms, and without mm. worms, you're not going to have a healthy soil. Right, right, right. I mean, and, and actually, this leads to the next question, which I'll give my answer to it, is <laughs> if I go to a farmer at a homestead, and I determine, in, and not in a judgmental way or not, whether they're a good steward of that land and their livestock, is if I hear them talk about worms. Mm. Yeah. Uh, even a little bit. Yeah, that's right. And if they're, if they're, if, if you start talking to them about worms, and they look at you and they got a glaze in their yeah. eyes, yeah. I got to ask myself, yeah. If you're not using worms as a measure of your stewardship, right. I think it's, a, it's not a bad thing, but I think it's good to use it. You know, I had asked you when we were here if anybody did worm castings, and you were saying no because it's just giant worm mm -hmm. castings, and you had someone come and actually record your worms, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How incredible was that? Yeah. But that's a great sign that you're being, yeah. uh, that God's getting a return on, him, on his right. investment. That's right. That's you right. Know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the spring, a sp spring especially when the worms are the most active, um, uh, we've actually had people turn their ankles walking because of the height of the worm casting. Um, That's amazing. It's, it's crazy, crazy. Uh, and again, again, what do you I'm, have? I'm, like I'm, Canadian night crawlers down here? Bragging. Bragging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah mainly big, yeah, the big ones. Big ones, Europeans, um, and yeah. Big old quarter inch holes, you know, big old holes. Isn't in it beautiful? Oh, it is. It it's really absolutely is. beautiful. I love worms. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We do too. And and so I'm, I'm not saying all that proudly. I'm just I'm just uh, saying it very humbly and appreciatively that you know these these systems work. You know, this isn't this isn't some sort of a crazy idea. Uh, this is this is the way nature works. And so it's our responsibility to to sit back, observe, what are the patterns, what is the order, and then, you know, then we... we Try to replicate it. We, du we duplicate it, yeah, we duplicate it the best we can yeah. right here. And, you know, nature doesn't make concentrated animal feeding operations. It doesn't make... So e everything we've done here, I mean, nature doesn't make monocrops. Nature, do nature doesn't fertilize with 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer. Um, and so everything we've done here uh, has been to try to um, to duplicate that that uh, you know that that those patterns, the patterns that we see. So I'm going to lighten up the conversation a little bit. We'll get back to this. <laughs> so this question is from Donna. Okay. From time to time, we see uh, podcast podcast clips from your Beyond Labels podcast with mm. Dr. Cena McCullough. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I showed you two pictures earlier, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put these pictures up right now. Okay. And if you notice in these two pictures, Joel is looking to his right. And we notice this with every single podcast with with uh, Dr. Cena. Donna wants to know, what the hell are you looking at? Are you playing solitaire? Are you doodling? Are you checking I'm, your email while she's talking? What's going on? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm making notes. You're making I, notes. I'm a prodigious note taker. Remember, prodigious, I was... Prodigious, good word. Yeah, prodigious, yes. From the English uh, major. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> See, I pay uh, attention. Yeah. So you know, as a, as a in my years of high school and college debate, um, you know, you have to take notes of what the other person's saying so you can respond to them. Yeah. Because in in the in the press of the moment, you know, they say something, say something, and then the next thing you know, you what was the first point? You can't remember it. So so you you have to kind of you know uh, write and articulate to jog your memory as you get up and respond because the judge is sitting here. He's expecting you to respond to every argument. Well, it, if you miss one, well, then that's that's like tacit approval. So you're not playing solitaire. No, no, no. I'm not, no, I'm not playing solitaire. Is this a story solitaire. you're going to stick with? Yeah, I'm, and it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. So, so I'm a prodigious <laughs> note taker, and I take, I take lots of notes. So on another kind of uh, lighthearted, <laughs> on a, a roll, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to let you contemplate it while I tell you my own favorite. Okay. So what's the most ridiculous regulation you've ran into over the last 50, 60 years here? Mm. And uh, what's been your favorite workaround, whether it's that or a different one? 
And I'll tell you mine while you contemplate right. that. Mm -hmm. So years ago, I had a store, and it was actually three storefronts that were connected. They had three different bathrooms. In between two of them was this closet-sized bathroom. And the building inspector came in and was trying to get me to get a building permit. And I'm like, you know, we haven't done a change of use. It was retail. This is retail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you're just trying to get my signature, so I give you authority over me. I'm not doing it. So in the bathroom, he wanted us to put in a GFI unit, mm -hmm. a GFI mm -hmm. uh, yeah. outlet. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, is there was no outlet in the bathroom at all. Mm. So I said, why would I have to put a GFI outlet in here? And he's like, any room that has water has to have a GFI outlet. I said, yeah, if there's already an outlet here, you have to upgrade it. He's like, no, the code says you have to have a GFI. You know, people like you and I, that's insanity. For me, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was angry, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said, you want me to hire an electrician at $100 an hour to come put in an outlet that doesn't exist so it had a GFI and you want me to sign this paper to ask you for permission to do something I want that you telling me I got to do and I got to pay you for the permission on top of that he's like yeah essentially and he's like I'll come back in a few days I'll bring the paperwork with me so you can fill it out so he leaves my, my brother who happened to be on location at the time. I said, hey, come on in here. Can you give me a favor? Get rid of this toilet, get rid of this sink, plug it up. So he just took it right out. We weren't using that bathroom anyway. It was one of three. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Nobody had used it in years. So he comes back the next Monday or Tuesday or whatever. It was three or four days later. He's like, yeah, I brought in the paperwork. I'm like, yeah, come on. So I fall, he follows me down the hallway, I open up and said, all we got is a closet here, man. And he's like, you took the toilet out? He says, you didn't get a permit to do that. I says, listen, we looked up the codes. You don't You don't need a permit to remove a toilet and cap the pipe. It's only if you change it. He was so bright red, ticked off. He just about ran out of that place, just stormed out. So mad. Never saw him again, though. So it was the most ridic ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and it was my favorite run around. Could, could you imagine that? Because you just yeah, wanted yeah. me to put that signature on that yeah. piece of paper handing yeah, yeah. over authority, oh, know, you know? know. Yeah, yeah. Put a GFI yeah. unit in a place yeah. that doesn't even have an doesn't outlet. Have, yeah, outlet. Yeah. So that's, that's my nuts. story yeah. I had to share. That's, yeah, because the whole point of a GFI is if you plug something in, you've got protection. Yeah, yeah. But if you can't it. plug anything in, you don't need any protection. Yeah. Can you imagine oh. that? Oh, my. It was just oh, a my. power play. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Obviously, sure. you know. Oh. Well, a lot of times... These local local regulators are worse than the federal because they're like they're like little little tyrants. You know, they're they're big fish in a little pond. Yeah. Um, so so my my biggest one was um, was when they came in and told us that they impounded. This is early on. They impounded all of our beef. So we used to go to a custom slaughterhouse in the fall with all of our beef. All of our customers would buy it live, quarter, half, whole, yeah. and we'd put their name on the carcasses when they went down to the slaughterhouse. And uh, because in custom, you can't sell, you can't sell um, processed meat. You only sell live, and then basically the customer's paying for the process. Okay, it's a, it's a little bit of a loophole. Okay, so um, so yeah, we've done this for years and years and years. And this one year they came in put police tape on it, impounded it all, basically half of our year's income, and accused us of selling un uninspected meat. All the people's names were on the carcasses, you know, Jane Doe, Jim Smith, you know, they're all on the carcasses. And we've done everything by the, you know, So they were basically by like the rule. denying the legitimacy of the system. Yes, yes, up, yes, right? yes, yes, absolutely. And there were other people doing the same thing and they didn't do anything to them. Yeah. So it, we, we had become a little bit of a, of a bigger player in the community and there were some people that didn't like us and so we got reported and so they had to do an investigation kind of put so, you in your place yeah yeah, yeah. exactly exactly okay so um <laughs> yeah so so in about a we had we had a showdown and um it took about a week and they we, we worked through our our uh, delegate and our senator one was a Democrat, one was a Republican. They both went to bat for us, and it took a week to, to finally 
punch through it. They took the police tape off and we were okay. And the guy came in the last day. He says, well, we're just going to act like this didn't happen. I said, maybe you are, but I'm not. He said, no, we're, we're going we're gonna to have a meeting here, and we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Now, when you say they, they did they actually physically remove it from yeah. here? They, they took the police tape off and said, you're, you know, you're okay. So, oh, so, so they, they just won't allow you to touch the meat that was here. I might, I'm sorry, I lost that. The meat, the meat was at the slaughterhouse. At the slaughterhouse. Yeah. Right. So That's they weren't going to let right. the sorry. slaughterhouse cut the meat until they completed their investigation. Well, I said, how long is that going? Well, it could take six months. I mean, they, they demanded that we give them the name, of our, name and address of all of our customers. I said, no, no, ain't going to happen. All right, so, so basically, it was a one-week showdown. The guy parked on our Jesus. doorstep. The guy parked on our doorstep. He came in with his big FBI-type badge, you know. I'm from the food inspection. You know, we've impounded all your meat down at the slaughterhouse. Yeah, it was a, it was a big deal. It was a come-to-Jesus time, let me tell you. It so was, it was, was a big deal. Was this the FDA? No, this was uh, VDAX, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Yeah. Also, with their federal people who were in Philadelphia, the Food Safety Inspection Service. All right, so these were the these were the big guys, and um, so anyway, when it all got done and our our politicians went to bat for us and we got it we got it worked around, um, I said, well, you might you might act like this didn't happen, but it ain't going to happen again. We're going to get this resolved now. So I got a meeting with our head guy at the state and his federal counterpart from Philadelphia, and they came down. We're gonna we're gonna iron this out, and I had my my elected my elected uh, people here and our attorney here and we had a summit <clears throat> and so so that, like you said this is a real come to jesus moment oh yeah yeah it was a big deal it, it, it was hurt a, you it was a big deal yeah. so so we're sitting in the living room and and um the break the kind of breakthrough happened when when i said well what would you do? What would you do? You've told me all the things I can't do. You put yourself in my shoes, and what would you do? There was this long, like, two-minute pause. Everybody's, you know, looking. and Two-minute pause is a long time when you're, you know, when you're having that kind of conversation. And finally one of them said, well, I guess you could sell it live. And then, because, see, we didn't want to sell it. We didn't want to sell it live without a carcass, uh, a carcass component, because some animals butcher out better than others. You know, some do 52%, some 60, some 58%, and so if you just do it live, you're not, you're not. One guy's going to pay more. One guy's going to pay less based on the actual, you know, yield, the actual percentage yield of that of that carcass. So the fair way is to do it by carcass weight, which is actually what you're eating, okay? And they said, well, finally, they said, uh, well, I guess you could, you could charge live and then charge shipping and handling based on the carcass weight. But thank you very much. That'll work just fine for us. So now, for, who, who, the, the state said that. Yeah, yeah, the state and that the federal was guy. There. That, offer of a that was their offer of a solution to leave you alone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A workaround. Yeah. That way we could still sell it by carcass. We could still sell it by carcass weight, but it actually wasn't a sale. It was a service. So instead of instead of selling the meat, we were gonna do a shipping and handling. We, we were gonna offer a service, a service of shipping and handling. Okay. And this this is their runaround. This is this is their workaround. This is their workaround. So so so. For several years after that, and of course they were thinking we'd charge, you know, two thousand dollars a head, and shipping and handling would be a little adjustment, you know, on carcass weight. Said no, nah, no. Nah. They make the rules. So from then on, we charge a dollar an animal, a dollar a steer, fifty cents for a half, twenty-five cents for a quarter. Boy, that shipping and handling. Two thousand dollars shipping and handling. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. You yeah, know. yeah. Based yeah. on carcass weight. Yeah. Shipping and handling based on carcass weight. Well, and, we used to do that on eBay years ago. Yeah. And, when and, you got a percentage, you yeah. sell it for a dollar and charge, yeah. you know, fifty dollars. Yeah. And, 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 and the beauty here, here, here's here's the funniest part of this. This is why I'm picking this one. I've got several, but this is my best one. Is that in Virginia, we charge sales tax on on product. 
We don't charge sales tax on service. So now the state goes in sales tax. Exactly. They used to send them thousands of dollars in sales tax. <laughs> and now it. now I send them, you know, um, $50. And they gave you the workaround. And they, and they gave me the workaround. The one that's your favorite. You didn't have to think of it, huh? <laughs> that's awesome. So that, That's my favorite one. That, how as long were you able to keep that going? Around. Oh, I did it for, we did it that way for, I don't know, eight or nine years. So and, and then and then and then you know, it was a joke. So we we went back to the other. And then they just left you alone. Well, be, be, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one reason why, was because we realized we would rather tangle with them, than with the sales tax people. Oh yeah. And so so yeah. that so we finally you know we did it a few years realized they weren't coming back. This was an you know they'd gotten a they'd gotten and they said it was an informant. They had an informant. Well, who's your informant? Well, we can't tell you. Yeah, they never. Uh, they uh, never uh, tell you. Aren't we supposed to be able to face our accuser? You're supposed to. Be aren't able we supposed to be able to face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so <laughs> that, that, that's my favorite workaround. Uh, now I'll give you the one we haven't been able to work around. This is the craziest one. So in our county, we, um, we we can have a sawmill, and we can cut our own lumber to use. To use. Yeah. Right. But if we make a chair out of that, we're a criminal because that making a, making furniture is manufacturing. Yeah. And we we don't have a workaround on that. But what, what but, but 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 if we ever had somebody that wanted to make, you know, wooden toys and furniture and stuff out of our wood, we would we would do it and sell it anyway. You don't have a cottage industry down here. Mm -mm. No. So, uh, no. Up where I am, we have a cottage industry. Like you can make. I don't know what the number is. I want to say it's oh, so, like thirteen thousand dollars a year mm. selling blueberry cupcakes. Uh huh. Uh huh. But then if you go, you know, out okay. of your house, but so, if you go thirteen thousand one dollar, now. Yeah. So we we can do three thousand dollars worth of pickles, but it's only pickles. But it's only, it's only pickles. <laughs> not chairs from your <laughs> not lumber. Cha not chairs. Not not cupcakes. Not you know. It's pickles. Pickles. Yeah. Uh, we call it the pickle bill. You know, it's it's funny that you get. <laughs> it, it's actually ridiculous. You, I think of some of the biggest companies I can think of in my head. Uh, Mary Kay Cosmetics. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, Yankee Candle. I don't know if you've uh -huh. ever yeah, heard yeah, of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, they, well, everybody they, knows. Yankee they all Candle. started in their garages. Yeah. In their well, basement. You know something. Yankee Candle was in his basement. Don Tyson started in his basement. Yeah. Frank Purdue started in his Can't basement on, on the on the tail end of a pickup truck. You you yeah, are hitting yeah. the nail on the head. The the reason that all this is so terrible is because all these big outfits started from the tailgate of a pickup truck, and then they and, became lobbyists. And, to... Yeah, and 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 now now you can't do it. So yeah. so if you if we want to preserve the opportunity for the next innovative you know innovative turn of the wheel, we have to preserve a way for prototypes to access the market yeah and and and, and we don't we don't have that right and now. it used to be if you wanted to build some chairs i'll call you up say hey joel yeah, build listen, some chairs you got a you got a lathe yeah i got a saw yeah we got this garage come on over let's build some chairs, build some chairs. Yeah. and then you go down to uh. you know uh Tom's furniture store mm -hmm. and said, "Look, we got ten chairs. Would you like to order them?" Mm -hmm. He buys them. Yeah. He sells them. If there's a good sale, yeah. he goes, "I got a hundred. Yeah. And you work out of your garage, and before yeah. you know it, you got to yeah. go to a factory. Yeah. Now, with all the regulatory, you have to have the factory first. You got to put in a million dollars to make a chair. That's right. And and that and that is that is the scale prejudicial nature of all of these regulations. It's like a three thousand dollar thermometer. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. yeah. And any time a regulation is scale prejudicial, i.e., easier to comply with if you're big than if you're small, that is an inherent. Not only is it unfair, but is it is an inherent impediment to prototypical innovation in the marketplace. Now you you've done, unless I'm, I'm misunderstanding, you've done some work with Nick Friedis. Yeah. Huh? Um, yeah. He's one of our Virginia um, delegates. Delegates. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything coming up with them planned at all? Yes, we do. We on? actually we actually have a a constitutional amendment planned that would be a little bit like Maine's, although it would be a little more comprehensive. I'm not in Maine. Don't slander me, okay? <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> no, well, I we, d down here, New England is New England. Yeah, you know? it's all Maine. 
<laughs> Call Maine or Boston, one or the other, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just so, so um, uh, it would be a constitutional amendment that would that would guarantee that that would give um, the the um, shall not infringe shall not infringe on the on the rights of a person to acquire the food of their choice from the source of their choice in a voluntary transaction. Here's the problem. You're going to run we're, into the same thing that Maine ran into, right? Yeah. Where the feds say, okay, that's we're right. just not going to that's right. That's right. process but, anything yeah. out of here anymore that, or whatever it was, yeah. right? That, that's right. But you know what? Um, we need this. We need, the, we need to be pushing back on this. We Everybody need to be pushing does. back on this. And... Um, and see, the problem right now is, like, you can, well, let, let's say, let's say, uh, freedom of religion, okay? Um, if 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 the government, um, or let's take freedom of speech. Let's leave religion out of it for a minute. Freedom of speech. If if the government censors your speech, you can sue. Um, and a constitution, you have a constitutional right. To freedom of speech. Yeah. Okay. Well, right now, there is no constitutional right for you to be able to choose what you're going to eat. None. In fact, federal judges have ruled from the bench there is no right in the U.S. whatever jurisprudence uh, for you to be able to choose your food. None. Well, yeah, John Adams never thought it was going to be an issue. That's right. That's right. They, neither they, did Ben yeah, Franklin. Of I mean, if you if you said to them, if you, said, you know, there's going to be a day when a person can make a, a, a pot pie in their kitchen and can't sell it to a neighbor. They would say, "Oh, you're crazy." Of course, yeah. So, so the point is, the the legal term is, you can't sue for something. You can't claim an uh, an, an an infringement. Unless that. you've been harmed. That's called standing, standing. legal standing. Yeah. You have to show legal standing. So the problem is, since we don't have any right to, a, to, a, to our food choice, we don't have any right to choose what to eat, we have no standing if a bureaucrat denies us that right. And so, so what this does is it begins, it begins to give the citizen the right for that choice so if a bureaucrat comes in and says, um, "No, you you can't um, you can't acquire raw milk because raw milk sales are illegal," now I can sue constitutionally and say, "I'm being denied raw or, milk." Or if the USDA says, "Okay, you can have your law, but we're not going to allow processing out of the state like they did to Maine," yeah. you got standing there too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So anyway, so you and Nick are both working on this together. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Virginia Independent Consumers and Farmers Association. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're 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 looking at what kind of language we want and that sort of thing. But but the but I just I just gave you the basic the basic pitch is to give standing to you and I right you and me in this major um, give standing <laughs> to I us. struggle with that too, and I wasn't an English teacher. <laughs> Give, give standing, you know this, yeah. yeah. Give standing to us, all right, so that so that we now have standing if a bureau if a bureaucrat infringes on our right to choose our food, then so, we uh, then we can get. Um, uh, I was under the impression that a few years ago you helped with some legislation that was similar to this in the cottage industry here in Virginia, where you could make chairs out of your own wood. From your uh, yeah, but we didn't succeed. Oh, it didn't we go didn't. We didn't succeed. Yeah, I was involved with that. Uh, it was a pretty broad one as well, but uh, but that that did not that did not go anywhere. What, what do you think it is in the mentality of a politician or a bureaucrat where they want to say to you, "Hey, you can't make a chair out of your own wood." It, it, I mean, is it a mental disorder? No. <laughs> is it evil? What is no, it? it? It's safety. It's all about safety. You do think they I, I'm here give to a rat's ass you. about oh, your safety? Oh, look, absolutely. Excuse listen, my language. Li but listen, do you really yeah, think listen. They care? Listen, our our head of um, uh, meat and poultry inspection in Virginia. I was down there at a hearing once, and um, and during a break, he comes up to me, you know, nicely, and he says, he says, Joel, we can't let people choose their food. We couldn't build hospitals fast enough. For all the bad food people would choose. 
And I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, and the food that you stamp that's good, you know, is all does he good. But 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 that but that you know that helped me see. Does he uh, not see the kidney dialysis centers opening up all over the place? Yeah, but but he he would not say that he won't that, make the connection. I'm sorry. No, he, well, well, no, well, he, 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 yeah, yeah. He, he he would he would simply say, well, that's that has nothing to do with food. He said that has nothing to do with food. Right. Um, and, and so so the problem we have, Matthew, the problem we have right now in our in our nation is that because the federal government has taken such a tyrannical stand on this, uh, an interventionist stand on this. When I looked at him, we had this conversation, you know, he says, he says, we can't build hospitals fast enough. Well, I'm sitting here thinking, I think if we had food freedom to where I could drop my prices by 30 or 40% and a lot more people could afford my good food and a lot more farmers could access the local market. You need less hospitals. I think we need less hospitals. Yeah, I agree. But the, but the problem is we, we can't even run an experiment on, on a locality. Because the federal comes in like Maine, overrides, gets involved, and so so we can't even try, we can't even attempt a different model because it's illegal from the outset. So so we we can't even do an experiment. Yeah. I mean, why why can't we have why can't why can't we have the Fed say, um, you know, we really think this is not a good thing, but you know what? We're gonna we're gonna offer a a five year um, uh, a freedom to do this for a locality to try this if they want to, with a sunset clause, automatic sunset five years. You got five years to do your experiment, and and if if we don't re up it in five years, it automatically goes away. See, I I, I gotta respectfully push back a little bit because I don't believe it's about safety. I really do believe it's about control. And one of the reasons I believe this is um, there's a guy that builds earth ships, an old hippie dude. I mm-hmm. can't think of his name. Mm-hmm. I think he was in Arizona or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to do experimental housing, earth mm-hmm. ships, and build them. And, and he had to go through this whole process for years to get permission mm-hmm. to dig a hole out in the desert and put like a dome on it as an experimental house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It didn't come to safety. It was like the house but, is going to be built this way because the bureaucracy says no, so. No, 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 no. I, 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 I disagree. I've talked to a lot of these people, and I believe that they didn't want the house to be built that way because they were afraid it might fall in on him. And they were trying to protect him from himself. You think they care? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, they care. Oh, they care. They, they, th- they, they deeply care. Yeah, I guess maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, you're turning. <laughs> You're really turning me around here, Joel. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, all, all I'm saying, you know, I might be wrong. All right, I, 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 I might be wrong, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this: that um, that if you assume that they have good intentions, yeah, you'll have a lot better conversation than if you than if you assume they're after control. In other words, if you're wanting a conversation with them, if you're wanting to have a a conversation with them. Giving if, them the benefit of the doubt. If, if you go in saying, yeah. I understand you're concerned about safety, if you start in that way, they will be much more ready to listen to your point than than if you say you're just interested in control. Yeah. Um, because I've dealt with these guys a long time, many, many different things, and, and I don't think it's control. I think they're really well-intentioned people. For the most part, I mean, there are certainly you know arrogant uh, people, but but um, for the most part, I think they're well intentioned, and they're they're just trying to protect. You know, protect I hope us. you're right in that because it does give hope that we can change it. Yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. if it's the other, there's no hope. Oh no, that's right. That the, the other is just tyranny. The, the other is just tyranny. Right. But but it, it's all about safety. I mean, yeah. with my. I could go on for days mm-hmm. about my experiences with, especially local tyrants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You are right, they're the worst. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole GFI thing, mm-hmm. that told me that they don't care about safety because it had nothing to do with safety. There wasn't even an outlet in that room. It was about control at that point. Yeah. So maybe I just, I'm well, taking, well, sometimes, I'm projecting him yeah, on yeah. The, well, them all. Some, I, you know. I, 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 I'll give you the, the, the credit there. I think in some cases, they are just trying to um, to exercise 
their need to exist. Yeah, justifying their job. Just, justifying their need to exist. And that's still a little more gentle than control. Uh, they, they need to justify their need to exist. And, and, and I've, I've, it, it still stems from being a watchdog, from being careful. I mean, I've had people stand in the, you know, in the sales building and say, well, I would, never, I would never enter a building that didn't have a building permit. I'm saying you're standing in one. <laughs> really? Our house was built in 1790. It's still standing. You reckon it's going to outlive a bunch of these building permits sticking, sticking houses going up around? Um, yeah, 100 years from now, that'll still be there. Yeah. And the one up the road won't Yeah, be. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so um, uh, you know, we, we've got this, we've got this, this just uh, um, mistrust. It, it, it comes down to two things. One is, A, we mistrust each other. I, I can't trust you to, to do a good job. And the second thing is, we've got a mentality in this country that government is more trustworthy than business people. And, and I don't really, I have a real hard time with that because yeah. our, the government, every government worker, including politicians, is just our neighbor. Yeah. That we yeah. decided to give them yeah. the honor the power. Mm -hmm. of representing yeah. us, whether it's mm -hmm. in Congress or mm -hmm. whether it's in a building inspector mm -hmm. position, they're supposed to honor the community by being, having integrity mm -hmm. and, and using discretion and common sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anytime they start telling you they can't use discretion mm -hmm. or common mm -hmm. sense, or, in my view, they're lying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, they, you know, they have, they have codes and, and you got to realize too, that as far as the bureaucracy is concerned, um, it attracts you know, I've heard there's three kinds of people. Uh, there's people... Home that, <laughs> Is that in there? <laughs> there there's, there there's people that, um, that want to encourage you to go. People who want to stand by and watch you go. And people who want to make you stop. And bureaucracies, regulators, attract people who want you to stop. I mean that's their that's their overall arching thing, is the easiest thing to do is to say no. Why? Because no is you're not liable for no. You know if I say yes, something happens. Then guess who gets chewed so, out? Is the concern of safety like you said they want to keep you safe, mostly because they're self liability? Yeah, because they don't want to be the one that gave permission for something where people got hurt. Yeah. 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 And so not quite honorable. But understandable. Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it, it's understandable. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of. I mean, nobody was looking for control when they made seatbelt laws. Um, I mean, if I want to, if I want to drive without a seatbelt, what's that to the government? You know, I mean, I wear one anyway because I think they, I think they're helpful. But yeah. if I don't, why should the, why should a government agent be able to tell me I can or cannot, you know, uh, wear wear a seatbelt? And then, and then when you have, you know, when you have Obamacare and you have the government in charge of health care, then suddenly our behavior has an economic component to it. And it that if I engage in risky behavior and you're paying for my care, suddenly you have a, a vested interest in telling me how I'm supposed to live or not. Yeah. And so if the, if, the, if the orthodox narrative is that Mountain Dew is fine, but, but, Mountain but, Dew is but, fine but raw milk is not. The same people who are telling you that's fine also have stock yeah. in insulin companies yeah. and cancer research companies and, yeah. you know, big pharma. Yeah. It, they, I think it was in one of your books, but, but it's been said by many, these people... They all have lunch together. Yeah. They all golf together. Yeah, it's a fraternity of ideas. It's yeah. a fraternity of ideas. They all drink the same Kool-Aid. Exactly. And, and, and it's a fraternity of ideas. And That's like right. George Carlin said, they don't have to outwardly speak the conspiracy when their interests co-align. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah. it's, a, it's probably a mix. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of good people in yeah. every organization. And then there's some that, you know... Any organization is going to attract evil people that are going to take advantage of it. Sure. 
And sure, just like like everybody that puts on a black word backwards collar isn't a saint. <laughs> there's plenty of charlatans there too. You oh, know? Yeah. So there's yeah. so so every every business, everything, including regulators, yeah, has its good and bad ba- bad eggs. Yeah. A- abs every one of them. Every one of them. Yeah. Because the corrupt need a job too. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll they'll yeah they'll gravitate towards where they can right you know sure yeah sure. so uh I I see the I guess it slightly changed the subject but on the topic of food I kind of see the food system as the hub of all all the other systems right and if that food system is not mm. perfectly round mm. that hub's not round if it's rotted out you can have all your spokes be the same length and, but they're going to be out different, and you can't turn that wheel. Right. And the food right. system, you know, it affects the education system. Mm-hmm. If you're not eating right, you're not learning right because mm-hmm. you can't absorb information. If you're not eating right, it affects the health system, health care system, because mm-hmm. you're sicker. Including mental health. Mental health. Psychologically. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Vegan, vegans don't get enough fat to make brain cells. You, you know? know, I mean, the and carnivore fe- diet. Feedlot, feedlot beef doesn't have... Um, you know, conjugated linoleic acid, and and I mean, there's all sorts of cool I, stuff. I, the carnivore diet is just going through the roof now. Yeah, yeah. You know, thank mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Uh, you know, it it affects every system, the financial system. You know, mm-hmm. if you're not healthy, if you're not, well, hell, if you're growing your own food, mm-hmm. now you don't have to be as much of a slave like we were talking mm-hmm. earlier to make ten dollars to buy a five dollar dozen of eggs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's mm-hmm. amazing to me that people are okay with this. That. Mm-hmm. No, they're complaining. Oh, eggs are five dollars. No, eggs are ten dollars because the government took half your money. Remember, so you had to make ten to be left with five. Yeah, and you tell yeah. people that, and they go, "No, no, 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 it's five. No, it's ten dollars." Yeah, I'm I'm reading a book right now of a guy that started farming in 1850 in Wisconsin, and he bought 450 acres for a dollar twenty-five an acre. Yeah. Under, under the Homestead Act, probably. No, 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 no. This was no. just this was on the on the market. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, because the Homestead Act didn't come in until 1860, 60, 1860. 1860. A- Abraham Lincoln did the Homestead Act. Yeah. Uh, this was this was eighteen fifty. And even that got but twisted, I, but I, I, unfortunately. Yeah, but but I I I do think it was it was might have been a special pioneer. You know, it was a, it was part of a five hundred thousand acre tract that they did. But but anyway, still, yeah. still, I mean. Even if the market was double that, <laughs> yeah, two fifty an acre. You know? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> you know, we we have a chunk of land, not that you ask, next to us has twenty two acres, and mm-hmm. the lady wants a lot of money for it. She right mm-hmm. now she just leases it for corn. Mm-hmm. So we got some. I won't even say the word. Some guy next door, growing twenty two acres of GMO uh-huh. feed corn, feed corn, mm-hmm. which is. But the soil in in the property we have next to that it used to be one spot mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's on a plateau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel, I dig down four or five feet all over the place. Oh. Not a single rock. Oh not, wow! Not a single rock. Unbelievable. Maybe maybe like a little. Yeah, pebble. yeah, yeah. Wow. And it's just all topsoil. Like, wow! Uh, I haven't gone past five feet yet. But unbelievable! I, it was such a good score. I mean, our house is all gutted. Uh-huh. It's an 1865 house, mm-hmm. but we're transforming it, mm-hmm. turning it, turn it into a homestead. Mm-hmm. But that's been, what a blessing that's been, is just having this incredible soil. And we're making it better. For yeah, us, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the yeah. worms that's, and the wood chips. That's, I don't even know what to, I don't even know how to think about soil like Complete that. Complete you know? opposite of what yeah, you started opposite. with. Yeah, I mean, we, here, I mean, <laughs> if, if we, if we can dig down two feet for a post hole, we're, we think we're in heaven you know yeah um so so i, I was walk- just i was just out in oregon you know and i'm going out through there at those all those fields and, and i said so how far do you go down here before you hit rock oh 12 feet i mean it, it's all a volcanic it's all volcanic all uh, volcanic ash you know? yeah 12 feet before you hit a rock i mean just could you imagine no i can't imagine i can just yeah. say yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. teasing you <laughs> sorry <laughs> so well, I, when I got here early today, I was looking around, and I couldn't find the trees where you were growing your boneless chicken breasts. Are they out of season? 
Yeah, yeah, the frost got him. The frost got him? Because I was looking for the dinosaur all, nuggets, all too. I couldn't find the dinosaur nuggets. They all just fell off. They all fell off when uh, the frost damn. came. Well, I have to come back into the late spring, I guess, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So, Joel, over the years... <laughs> <laughs> I expected to find him around here yeah. somewhere. I wanted some dinner, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so over the years, you've been an inspiration to me. Mm. I really thank you for taking the time to sure. let me just sit down and chat with you for sure. a couple hours. You're welcome. And I, I know over the years, you've entertained tens of thousands of people here on your farm. Mm. You've traveled the world all over, mm. speaking to people, inspiring people. Mm. You know, and after your tours, people come up to you just like my wife and I did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Want to take a picture, and you're gracious. Mm -hmm. You uh, do several podcasts a week. You're doing more and more of them, it seems, mm -hmm. as you're transitioning yeah. into the next mm -hmm. level of stewardship right. of uh, knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. just a stewardship of land, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is really beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, people like, including me, ask you for your time oh you're going to be in this area can i do a podcast mm -hmm. can you speak at this event can mm -hmm. you speak at that event and you're gracious you're so gracious with everybody and anybody who watches your videos and watches your tours i mean everybody including myself coming from your tours we post them on the youtube you know and it mm -hmm. and I, I know you do that to because you want the reputation to to be inspired mm -hmm. and spread mm -hmm. but so many people take 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 from you and ask of you so i want to ask you and I, I think a lot of people are interested are you happy mm. am i happy i mean when's the last yeah. time somebody asked you if you're happy uh they don't ask that often i, I appreciate that very much um I'm, I'm extremely happy um uh um so 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 much gratitude um I mean, I'm happy on so many fronts. Um, one is just to see the flourishing of the farm. I mean, the, the ecology of it. To see the, uh, the the team that we have here. Uh, my favorite thing now is to have visitors say, "Your whole team. They smile. They're they they seem to you know just have a zest for life." And um, and and that comes from vision. You know, that comes from from vision and to now be able to transfer um, that that vision to the next generation and see them grab it and run with it uh, is just is just um, yeah, I get teary I mean it just is so it's so wonderful and then, you know of course you know to see to see the the number of people who now um, appreciate you know, we're we're now. I mean, this farm hasn't had a chemical on it since 1961. That's becoming one of the older ones. You know, there are a lot of people that transitioned in the you know the 80s and the early 90s and stuff. But um, but to to get the testimonials, the letters, the encouragement from folks who who use our meat, and poultry, eggs, things, um, and who get well. Literally, you know, these are sick people, and they and they get well. Um, is really, really, that all makes me happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, it gives me a lot of joy to hear that. Very, cause, very happy because yeah. you have been such an inspiration in my yeah. life. Yeah, and, and many people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, that's just wonderful to hear. I'm yeah. so. Yeah. Grateful that you gave me this time. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm glad you're happy. I am. And yeah, you, your, your father left a legacy. Yes, he did. That his farm continued with you. Mm hmm And now you're gonna leave a legacy with thousands of farms. Right. So right. the combined legacy mm -hmm. of both you and your dad, and yeah. Teresa and yep. your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, a great return on investment for God. It is. Thank you for recognizing it. It's and, been a and pleasure talking yes. with you. Likewise. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, we cleaned off the chocolate milk, so I guess we got to get up. That's some dang good chocolate milk, ain't it? <laughs> it's good chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs>